Saturday University is sponsored by University of Wyoming, University of Wyoming Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and UW Outreach School. The program is presented locally by Sheridan College. It's my pleasure um, and privilege to introduce the third of our speakers, whose name is Ben Rashford. Ben's a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Wyoming. His area of scholarly emphasis is wildlife economics, which he says is not a field, although he's making it a field. He will make it a field in front of our very eyes today. Uh, ben looks at the intersection of waterfowl, hunting, and conservation. Ben got his bachelor's and master's degree in economics at the University of Wyoming. He received his PhD from Oregon State. Um, and aside from his research and teaching, Ben has many addictions. That's how he talked to me about them yesterday, addictions. He's addicted to saltwater fishing, which he'll be doing in the Bahamas in a couple of weeks. So more winter, nothing but winter, you know. Um, he's addicted to bow hunting in the snowies. He's addicted to duck hunting and training bird dogs. He's also a photographer of hunting and fishing exploits. And today he's going to talk to us about the future of waterfowl management, conservation, and hunting. So please welcome Ben Rashford. It always sounds like I lead a much more exciting life when someone else describes it. <laughs> and thanks for emphasizing lunch. That'll make everybody want to get out of here quickly. <laughs> This is my second Saturday U, and I always enjoy doing it, mostly because I get to listen to other great talks. But I also hate it because it reminds me that economics is incredibly boring, especially <laughs> relative to animal psychology. But fortunately for you and me, we're really not going to talk about much economics today. We're going to go on a little you know, tour and look forward into the future. But in order to look forward into the future, we have to start in, uh, in Missioner style, going back to the beginning. And the beginning when it comes to waterfowl conservation started about 80,000 years ago when the last glacier pushed its way into North America. This is the Wisconsin glaciation. And about 10,000 years ago, it started to retreat. And as you guys know, as glaciers retreat, they carve out holes in the landscape. And those holes fill up with water. And across the prairie region of the United States, those holes turn to prairie potholes. And the prairie pothole region, you can see there in the picture, has millions of these pothole lakes. And over the next 10,000 years, these prairie potholes became known as the North American Duck Factory. <laughs> I, that's not my term. <laughs> Literally, uh, across North America, the prairie pothole region constitutes about 30% of the breeding habitat for waterfowl, but produces nearly 80% of the birds that we see flying south every year. So it's a critical nesting area for North American waterfowl. But there's also this role of, of conservation and hunting. And in order to understand that, we don't have to go back quite as far. We can go back and start in the 1700s with colonialization and the westward expansion and market hunting. Out west we all know about uh, bison being hunted, but bison weren't the only thing and big game weren't the only thing that were market hunted. On the east coast, waterfowl was a major market commodity. They had these giant cannons called punt guns. Where you could kill 50 birds at a time. And they'd pluck the feathers and ship the feathers back to Europe for pretty hats. And this started to wipe out waterfowl on the eastern seaboard. But then there was this rise of sport hunting, especially amongst the affluent. And when the affluent get involved with something and they, they see that what they like to hunt is being killed and sold back to European women's hats, they start to raise a stink. So sport hunters started to raise a stink. And that led to a landmark Supreme Court case that essentially established the public trust doctrine that we know in North America, we know in the United States. It established a, a, what is really the North American model of wildlife conservation that's unique around the world, where the public owns wildlife, which is to say no one owns wildlife. So this, this public trust, trust doctrine implies that wildlife are here for the people, and the government decided they should be managed by the states using science. 
And then throughout the, the late 1800s and early 1900s, we started to see, largely pushed by hunters, more wildlife laws developed. Now the first um, state hunting license were issued. The Lacey Act, is anyone familiar with the Lacey Act that restricts how you can transport wild game across state boundaries? So we started to, to manage wildlife with laws. And then there was the first federal bird reservation. Does anyone know where the first federal bird reservation was? Come on, nobody wants to take a guess. Is it audience participation, keep us. <laughs> no, but the Chesapeake Bay was where a lot of this started. No, it was in Florida, um, Pelican Islands in Florida. And it was signed as an executive order by Teddy Roosevelt to connect back, who of course was an avid hunter. And that really started the national refuge system. But up to that point in the early 1900s, hunters were playing a role in the conservation and management of wildlife, but that role was primarily advocating policy. Most of the hunters in that era, other than those that were hunting just for consumption, were affluent and hence had political persuasion. But starting in 1934, we start to see hunters playing a very critical role in supporting conservation and management because they started to provide most of the money. The first duck stamp was issued, and today 98 cents of every dollar for a duck stamp, which is required to hunt waterfowl, goes directly towards wetlands conservation. It's conserved about 5.3 million acres to date. This is a few years old, so it's probably a little more than that now. And the Pittman-Robinson Act, which put a tax on hunting and fishing equipment, raises $5 billion. Also, Ducks Unlimited, I always have to acknowledge Ducks Unlimited because they fund much of my research. <laughs> they were established in 1937, and other groups that you all are familiar with, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Pheasants Forever, these are groups that raise enormous amounts of money for conservation. Ducks Unlimited has conserved about 12 million acres in the Prairie Pothole region as of a few years ago. So this idea of the North American, North American conservation model Hunters play a central role. They play a central, central role in both pushing for legislation and in providing the majority of the funds. But the question we're going to ask as we look forward is how long can this go on? But to do that, we have to step backwards again. So we've got this prairie pothole region, which in the early 1900s is the duck factory. Lush grassland and pothole lakes producing millions of waterfowl. Those waterfowl, of course, migrate south every year. You know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, those birds would settle along the Gulf Coast. Many of them fly all the way into South America to spend the winter and back every year. But at the same time, something was happening down south. The Mississippi Alluvial Valley, settlers there thought the soils were terrible. It's that clay soil, it was unsuited for growing crops. So in the early 1900s, it was hay and cattle country, and ducks generally flew over the top of it. But in the 1920s, some of those ranchers started to realize that, hey, this, this soil doesn't drain any water. That'd be a good way to produce rice. They started to develop these fields along the Mississippi for rice production. By the mid-1900s, there's over 2 million acres of rice production in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, produces two-thirds of the rice that's consumed in the United States. Well, it just so happens that flooded rice fields <laughs> make wonderful wintering duck habitat. In fact, very wonderful. It, it provides the, the insect life that hens need to produce eggs, the energy that they need to fly back north to the prairies. So, what happened? You know, more and more ducks began settling in this region. And hunters followed. Again, a lot of affluent hunters followed. And you get the Stuttgart rice and duck capital of the world. And this developed a very rich waterfowl hunting tradition in the region. Has anyone ever been down there during duck season? Yeah. These people like to duck hunt. <laughs> so you have this tradition developed. And these hunters, over the last 80 years, have been sending their money north to the prairies to conserve the wetlands that produce the birds that fly south. But at the same time that conditions were improving for birds down south, 
a different change was happening up north. The expansion of agriculture, the mechanization, and especially some of the farm policies post-World War II, they began draining wetlands in order to produce crops. By the 1960s, 50 to 90 percent of the wetlands in the Prairie Pothole region were drained. Iowa, 90 percent, up into Canada, closer to 50 percent. And of course, as they drained those wetlands, they started to reduce the number of ducks that are being produced. So where are we now? Well, the Prairie Pothole region is still the duck factory of North America. It still produces more birds than any other region. And it's supported still largely by private money and big policies like the Conservation Reserve Program. And the duck capital of the world still exists. Tens of thousands of people still want to travel there every year to have their duck calling contests and to see who can shoot more birds. But can this go on looking into the future? Well, we know that we're seeing a trend in hunting participation. Since the 70s, the number of hunters has declined. The number of duck stamps sold has been declining consistently. As those decline, that means things like the Pittman-Robertson Act and the duck stamp dollars start to decline as well. We've been a little bit fortunate. It's, we, we have fewer hunters today, but they buy a lot more crap. <laughs> so if they're buying a lot more crap, and the crap's a, a lot more expensive than it used to be, the tax revenue hasn't dipped nearly as much as what might be expected, but you can see duck stamp dollars are starting to decline. So for now, things seem okay when it comes to financing conservation and continuing to protect the prairies, but there's a problem. All of the money that, that hunters raise through licenses, through the Pittman-Robertson Act, through purchasing duck stamps, is getting spread thinner and thinner every year. It's still the primary source of funding for almost all game and non-game management. And I'm sure you guys have been reading the paper and watching what's going on with Wyoming Game and Fish and their struggles to try to figure out a new funding model because they have to manage every species in the state. And hunter dollars are not enough to do it. And this is playing out all over the country. And at the same time, if you want to protect grasslands and wetlands in the Prairie Pothole region, you have to compete with big agriculture. And the value of agricultural land has skyrocketed there in the last few years. As much as $10,000 an acre for ground that can grow corn in Iowa. So a dollar to save that one wetland has to get spread out and it disappears too quickly. And then of course, we have the growing global demand for food and fuel these days. The U.S. prairies have the potential. There's still a lot of unbroken ground. They have the potential to produce a lot more food commodities and unfortunately more biofuels if we go that direction. This is continuing to put more and more pressure on the waterfowl habitat that remains. We also have farm policies and through the last farm bill, and I, by last farm bill I mean the one that wasn't signed yesterday, the last farm bill, had a lot of programs that supported wildlife and wildlife habitat, especially in the Prairie Pothole region. CRP was an enormous boon for ducks. It's 4.7 million acres in the PPR. And CRP ground has particularly high nest success. Birds do well producing babies on CRP, certainly better than they do in cornfields. But every year that goes on, millions of acres of CRP are scheduled to expire. There was also the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, which has conserved 25 million acres of habitat since 1986. It was created in association with the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, which is an agreement between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. It's one of the largest wildlife agreements in the world. And it's been a huge success. And NACA takes money from hunters, puts it directly towards wetland conservation. But these programs are perpetually on the congressional chopping block, along with so many other programs. So there's no telling how long or what changes might affect. In fact, we have, oh, yep, I have an update from the signing of yesterday's Farm Bill. It was actually pretty good. I haven't talked to my colleagues at Ducks Unlimited to get their take yet, but there are a few things that are quote unquote bad for ducks. They decreased uh, conservation programs by about $4 billion. 
That sounds like a lot, but it's a relatively small cut. They decreased the maximum CRP acreage by 8 million acres. So we have a, a bunch of acres that are scheduled to expire over the next few years. The program's not going to be able to uptake those acres anymore because they have a cap. But there are some really good things for ducks. The sod buster and conservation compliance. These are rules that tell, tell farmers that if you drain a wetland, for example, you're not going to qualify for crop insurance. These are wonderful economic incentives to try to slow down the tilling of native prairie or the draining of wetlands. If corn prices are high enough, it's not a very big disincentive. But we were, all of the duck world was happy to see that those stayed in. And they were one of the big arguments that, want, that there were a lot of people that wanted those to get cut out of the farm bill. We also have potentially changing migrations in our story. Um, over the last hundred years, agricultural economists have documented the migration of corn and wheat and other major commodities. And they've been migrating north and west. They've been migrating from our traditional corn belt, for example, towards the prairies. So now the epicenter of corn production in the United States is right on the boundary of the prairie pothole region. If climate change is happening, we're going to see more growing degree days in this region, warmer temperatures, greater ability to grow crops like corn, and this migration of intensive cropping Biofuels, of course, is just a huge question mark. Depending on the direction the world and the country goes with biofuels, the biofuel demand for corn production stays high, this migration could happen much faster. Um, some of my own work has showed that climate change is going to affect the productivity of the wetlands that remain in the prairies. So as climate warms, we have fewer wetlands just because they evaporate quicker. And the ones that exist are less productive. And this, this picture is showing us how the, the conditions, the climate conditions necessary to have productive wetlands are predicted to migrate from the north to the southeast in the prairies. Migrate in exactly the direction that they're running into the expansion of corn and intensive crops. What does that mean? It means fewer ducks. Estimates as high as 40 to 70 percent, given climate and land use changes that are expected over the next 60 years. Looking back down south, warming climate can make some changes down there as well. They're expected to get um, less water, less rain, and they get drier, which means less water to grow rice. It might mean Oop, back up. It might mean that this wonderful wintering habitat that exists down there may start to go away at the same time. We also have changing migrations for birds. Um, we've documented, scientists have documented over the last 30 years that ducks don't fly as far south as they used to. There's more open water up north. There's food up north from agriculture. So we have this phenomenon called short stopping, where the ducks are no longer making it all the way down to the Gulf Coast or the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, and instead are settling in Kansas. Duck hunters in Kansas are very happy these days. They get dark skies in Kansas. <laughs> but this might mean fewer hunting opportunities down south. It might mean even less conservation dollars coming from hunters. So the climate and land use change of the last 10,000 years have created a, a, a perpetual duck factory in North America. But the land use and climate change expected over the next one or 200 years could undo all of it. So my professor at Oregon State always used to call these things a math problem. This is just a math problem. Open up your wallet and count out more dollars. And in a lot of instances, that may be true. There's a lot of uh, uh, wetland habitat that still can be conserved, but it takes an enormous amount of financial resources to do it. So if it's not hunter dollars, with hunters disappearing, whose dollars should it be? Who's going to count out the new math problem? So it's a, it's a semi-dire future. 
But on the one hand, waterfowl are incredibly adaptable. They've survived worse than us, and they'll probably darken the skies somewhere around the continent, no matter what we do. And hunters will probably be there, you know, paradoxically trying to conserve and kill them at the same time. <laughs> As a note, um, these ducklings did not imprint on me. They were <laughs> imprinted before. And this is uh, a picture from not too far from here, actually, during the terrible blizzard that, that you had in the early 2000s. You guys remember that? It was a bad day to be duck hunting. Oh, and with that, I, I went extra fast for lunch, so <laughs> we can... And <laughs> um, this, these aren't ducks. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are, there, are, so there are some ducks mixed in, I'm sure. Uh, it's in Kearney, Nebraska, during the Sandhill Crane Migration. Which, if you get a chance to go, you should. Yes. Uh, well, they're smaller, so there's some. No, no. Okay. Does Nature Conservancy have any impact in saving wetlands? The Nature Conservancy does have a role in the prairies. And what's surprising in the prairie region is groups like Ducks Unlimited tend to be the leaders in conservation on the ground and they leverage groups like the Nature Conservancy. So Nature Conservancy and Ducks Unlimited and other conservation groups and hunter groups tend to work together. So yeah, Nature Conservancy definitely has invested dollars. They usually do it through Ducks Unlimited. Why, why wouldn't the firearm industry have an interest in forking out more dollars in, in preserving and growing the hunting industry and water that power. is a that is a fabulous question. Everybody agree that's a, did everybody hear yeah. the question? He said, why wouldn't the firearms industry have an incentive to kick in? Um, I don't know the answer. Although I, I, I suspect that duck hunting is one group of hunters is probably a pretty small contribution to the firearms industry. So it's not right, but it's Feeds through the whole but you would think that it feeds through everything. Yeah. Yet I think, I seem to recall that they tried to raise the tax rate associated on fishing and hunting equipment, and a, the, the firearms lobby was against it. So, Imagine for that. obvious reasons. <laughs> Call your local firearm producer. <laughs> what about the economic impact of, in the future of just the people? You talked about everything else, but the people moving out into the land and the anti-hunting and anti-gun and at some point is there going to be wildlife that needs to be limited because people aren't going to want to put up with the buffalo running by for four days while they wait on Interstate 25 or <laughs> yeah that raises a number of issues I think for sure and we've seen that We've certainly seen that for the settlement of the West. We've wiped out a lot of species and decreased numbers of species that conflicted with us. And waterfowl <coughs> do conflict with people. In particular, they conflict with farmers. And they, the large rafts of snow geese that are causing problems now, wiping out crop fields, that provides an incentive for a lot of people to want to reduce those populations. You're all familiar with the prairies. We saw the pictures from Nebraska, a little to the south. There's not a lot of people there. There's not a lot of people to conflict with. And most of the people there still have that, you know, sort of that old Western landscape mentality. And hunting is still a popular pastime. But I think as that changes, which it seems to be, and as kids leave the region, if you talk to the farmers and ranchers in the prairies, none of their kids want to stay and farm and ranch anymore. And what happens when those farmers and ranchers don't have an heir to pass the property onto? It usually sells to big ag corporations that, for all the right reasons, have a profit motive that they need to follow. So the only way to change that is for the, the rest of the country to send the right signals about what it is that they want. You want cheap food or slightly more expensive food and, and pretty prairie landscapes. These are all things that get signaled through the marketplace. 
which is the economic side of it. What's the enrollment like at in the College of Ag and Conservation at the University of Wyoming? The College of Ag enrollment has grown every year for, since I've been here, which is six or seven years. And I don't know what the total enrollment is now. And there's a fair amount of programs related to conservation in the College of Ag. You know, a lot of it though is through the Reclamation Center. So it's really about reclaiming landscapes from energy development or disturbance. And then in the Ecosystem Science and Management Department, they do a fair amount of conservation. And that's one of the largest programs in the College of Ag. I think more of the sort of the training in conservation biology happens in the arts and science college, which is the largest college on campus. But I don't have any numbers. These are the sorts of things when you, you know, you send a, a, a professor out, they should give you a little. <laughs> the tell the foundation to do that, Tyler. We need it. Yeah. Anything else? Are we ready to eat? <laughs> different uh, funding model to add to the, what the hunters contribute to the wildlife conservation that would be something you would think would be acceptable to the rest of the citizens of Wyoming. What, what might that source be? Well, if we ignore the second half, that would be acceptable. Part. <laughs> um, did everybody hear the question? Because it's a, it's a good no. one. Uh, the question was, what sort of advice might I give to <coughs> Wyoming Game and Fish and the Wyoming legislature for a new funding model? Um, I don't have a good answer for it, but the, the paradox is clear. There, there's a lot more people than just hunters, than those that harvest wildlife, that benefit and enjoy it. And it's finding models that allow everyone to easily contribute to the conservation of wildlife that are necessary. Now there have been several things that have been proposed in the past and they get shot down every time. Things like fees. You know, entrance fees every time you go into the National Forest, entrance fees when you go into wine game fish management area. You know, additional fees that would try to target the non-hunter population. And they never, they never work. Um, there's been suggestions for things like excise taxes on more outdoor equipment. Photography equipment, backpacking equipment, snowshoes, you know. Expand that excise tax beyond just the things that focus on what hunters purchase. But every time those ideas are mentioned, they, they don't go very far. Would you guys pay a fee every time if you went on state land? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that's the way it has to be done. Somebody else have a... Yeah, wait, one more. Do you more. know if Ducks Unlimited allows women to be members? No. Yes, they do. <laughs> when did they start doing that? I, I don't know. I, the, the, the DU, the DU, the, the DU didn't, they didn't give me a, a cheat sheet either. <laughs> it was started by very affluent white males. Well, I think that was my comment from the start. If historically hunting and, and pleasure hunting in particular was a sport for the affluent, it looks to me it's going right back to that. Yeah, I think there might be some truth to it. I don't, I don't have the statistics to prove it, though. Are you suggesting we just get the affluent to there open up go. more of their pocketbooks? Yeah. Well, it seems like, I, seems like I've seen that in a newspaper recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, as we finish with a you know, decisive turn to the economic angle here, <laughs> let me tell you that um, Saturday University is paying for lunch, and nobody has to pay an excise fee uh, to come and enjoy that. So I'd like to welcome you and invite you all to, um, to the big, beautiful entrance foyer of this building, where we're going to have lunch. To access all of our Saturday U lectures and to find out about upcoming Saturday U events in your area, visit uwyo.edu slash Saturday U.